Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the next webinar in our mini series that we've been running over the last four weeks. Um, I hope you're all managing to stay safe, stay well, stay active, and also um, perhaps for the next hour, uh, stay uh, mentally active as well. We'll see what we can do with that. Um, we'll do some introductions in a second. Uh, first and foremost, if you've not yet seen the article, if you have a look on the handouts box, uh, you'll be able to download the article that we sent out as a pre-webinar read. If you've not managed to see it yet, don't worry. Um, you'll uh, pick it up uh, quickly as, as we go through the webinar, but please uh, download that now and you can start having a quick scan of that. Um, if you've already seen it and managed to send some questions and some replies in to us, thank you very much for that. Uh, but if you want to have a quick review of it as well, that's fine. Um, and we'll get going in a few seconds, just um, when everybody's managed to transfer from the lobby uh, into the, the main webinar area. So I'd just like to do a little bit of housekeeping first of all. Um, please, if you could turn your microphones off uh, and your camera off as well, that will just help with the connectivity for the webinar for all of us uh, and increase the quality, hopefully. Uh, please be aware that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we're hoping to... Um, but this is an on-demand service um, in the near future for people that have not been able to see it um, so we can make it more accessible to work uh, to more people because we are capped at a thousand people on this platform um, so please be aware of that so keep the chat box um, usage going but please be aware of your, your language and terminology in there keep that uh, professional and respectful please um, just as a quick note um, there will be a certificate available at the end of the webinar to download um, however, if you're watching this on demand, it's not available um, post live event. It's only available for those that have managed to join us live. Um, and the same goes for the handouts that will come as well. Um, the presenters today are myself, Chris Bramall, uh, and my colleague, Steve Wade. Um, and we'll be sharing the presentation in the next hour or so. And we'll be ably supported by Sharon and Tom, who have been on a couple already previously, if you've seen them before on their ones. And they're going to be managing the chat box for us so just a, a very quick introduction to who's hosting steve do you want to do a quick introduction to yourself and your background yep so hi everyone my name's steve wade and uh, probably had some communication from me over the last three or four weeks at some point whether it's for a certificate <coughs> or day on the webinars uh, <coughs> the regional manager for the east um i'm based in leeds and um so most of the clubs i work with are around yorkshire and lincolnshire but the region goes all the way down to Watford and to the East Coast, really. Uh, my experience is I was a teacher for around 10 years, ranging from early years all the way through to A-level, but predominantly in secondary. I um, joined FA three years ago. This is my third year. Um, throughout that time, we've been in, well, I personally probably been in, what, 100 primary schools where we've seen varying levels of delivery lots of experience around that so probably just sharing some ideas and some of the experiences we've had today with you guys today thanks steve um, so for those that don't know me um, i'm the regional manager for the north uh, i've worked in the fa's pe unit since it started in october 2013. my background before that was um, in teaching so after qualifying i taught in primary um, I specialised in physical education, so I just taught PE. I didn't teach uh, the other subjects, uh, which was a fantastic experience. I loved my nine years in the primary environment. Uh, and then I also taught at university level uh, on undergraduate degrees in PE, uh, sports coaching and teacher training. Um, so we've got uh, Tom and, uh, and Sharon with us. Do you want to do a quick introduction, you two? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm a PE coordinator in Shropshire and Staffordshire. Before this, I worked as a, a primary school teacher uh, across different age groups. Sharon? Um, thanks, Tom. Hello, I'm Sharon Maxworthy. I'm PE coordinator in the south, on the south coast, sort of Sussex and Hampshire and up to London. And I've been a teacher for 25 years and have been working as a member of the PE unit for the last three years. Thank you, you too, and thanks for your support as we as we go through the webinar with the chat box. Um, please um, do post on the chat box, and Sharon and, and Tom will be picking that up as we go through with any questions or comments. They'll be looking to, for some themes to pick up. Um, I think we've all got a, a background in education, as you've heard, uh, but I think something to, to, to make a point of uh, 
uh, early on here is that um, we're no experts in pandemic physical education. Um, so this webinar is possibly going to be slightly different to the previous ones, that we've not got a lot of content. There's not going to be as much teach and tell. Um, we, we thought this webinar would be best as a collaboration event, um, almost as a share event, um, which is why we sent out the pre-webinar questions. And we've had some unbelievable responses to that. I think the last count we were up to 260 um, people that had responded. So thank you so much for that. We're going to delve into those that, that gave permission to share some stuff. So we've got some wonderful ideas to share with you. Uh, and we've compiled those into a handout, which is probably going to be the most useful thing you'll get from the webinar. Um, and that will be released at the end. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's very much around learning and collaborating together here today. And that leads me into the end of the webinar, I guess. So we're looking at how we can reconnect with pupils, um, how important that is, and how we could use physical education uh, as an opportunity to do that. Perhaps longer term, we're thinking how we could shift the dial in physical education, particularly in primary schools, but also in secondary schools around its purpose, um, what it can do, uh, what service it can provide for, for pupils in terms of life skills and the holistic development piece that you've heard previously. I think when Sharon and Tom did theirs beyond the physical, that, that honed in on that a little bit. So can we shift the dial longer term as well as shorter term in terms of how we're gonna cope with this? Um, and then the third one there is, is like I mentioned a few minutes ago, how can you contextualize and find solutions to socially distant PE that fit with you? Because we're all gonna be in a different situation. Because we're all gonna be teaching in different schools that have got different environments, different contexts, different rules. So what works in one school is not necessarily gonna work in another, but hopefully from the ideas that come out today, you'll be able to find some solutions that, that might help you in your situation with your pupils. Uh, a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, we're not the government advisors on physical education in the pandemic and how to how to do that so um, we're not providing national guidance on this so we're just here to provide uh, ideas thoughts reflections on on what it might look like when we go back whether that's on the first of june or in september um, just to try and help you um, contextualize it to your own situation i guess really um, so if you can just prompt those thought of discussion, uh, but we're certainly not here to advise what you should or shouldn't do. That needs to come from the national and local authorities and your school and your senior lead leadership team uh, as, you, as your employer, I suppose. Right, we're gonna kick off. I'm gonna hand over to Steve uh, now, who's gonna have a little look at some of the responses we've had to the article. Yeah, so I'm just, um, as Chris said, we had a lot of people sending some really good in-depth answers and responses that clearly a lot of thought had gone into and as a result i'm going to just going to pick out a few examples or a few themes that really emerged that i saw from the first question that we asked um the first one being around so we had for example charlie honor and darren poppin talked about the importance of social skills and how this provides a massive opportunity to really focus on that obviously as a result of pupils being away from school for so long perhaps they haven't got siblings or close family and they've just been by themselves for up to nearly three months so how can we reintegrate them really develop their social skills perhaps rebuild areas such as confidence and self-esteem that they perhaps were already struggling with prior to this so that was a key thing that definitely came out um we also had a theme around the class sizes so people talked about including jane clark gave one really good example about how the class sizes are likely to be a lot smaller and does that give us an opportunity for that contact to be a bit more efficient and focused? Because we have how many times people all on this call and ourselves have said, that's really difficult with 30 kids. Well, this provides probably an opportunity to have a smaller class size and really focus in on them so can we get a bit more out of them? Um, that came out across the board at all the responses with a similar thing. We had one around, um, and Nicola King gave a really good answer around this as well, around how can we get the pupils to be really included in their learning pupil centered can we get them to come up with their own activities and games within the parameters that we set them schools will obviously have and as uh, chris has already alluded to they'll have different guidelines you'll have some of you'll have loads of outdoor space some you'll have minimal some might not have any so in your own context what are them parameters going to be but can we put the ownership onto the pupils to come up with games and ideas that are safe and meet the guidance and procedures that have been given to you. But in regards to question two, I'm just going to hand over to Chris and um, 
have a look at some of the things he'd come up with and what he'd seen from that, from the responses that we received. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, some of the uh, ones that came out, out for me was around this connection piece. That sort of resonated quite strongly for me uh, with the article. Uh, and uh, thanks to, uh, I'm just going to name a few people here. Apologies for ones that we've not uh, picked out, but um, with 270 responses, it was difficult. But yeah. well, thanks, Jodie Nicholson, Niall O'Brien, Andrew Wade, Nina Sweetland, Ellie Beaumont, Susie uh, Burnett, and Rodri Davis Camplin. Um, absolutely like some of the things that you'd put uh, in your feedback. So thank you for, for doing that and allowing us to, to use what you'd put. So some things that stood out from those uh, in particular were around uh, how how can we provide or do we have a more of an opportunity to provide more, more praise, more positive reinforcement, more opportunity to observe pupils um, with less in the class like Steve just alluded to. So have we got a better opportunity to connect with them, maybe because we've got less in numbers? Uh, and how can we look at restructuring our curriculum, perhaps, to um, to allow for this post-lockdown period to sort of emerge uh, from a PE perspective? So what have we got in terms of outdoor learning um, that we could utilise? What activities could we do? Could we still do team-based activities? Yes, is probably the answer to that. But it's going to need some real thought in terms of how you structure that with a, a social and physical distancing rule still in place. So it's not going to look like it might have looked like pre, you know, pre-pandemic, I suppose, really. But it is still possible. We're just going to need to reframe any activities or games that we might have um, accordingly, really. <clears throat> but yeah, using your school facilities more than maybe we would do normally. Would we stick to the to the playground and not venture onto the field, perhaps? Or certainly not use all four corners of, of the school school grounds. Maybe that's an opportunity. Um, a few people have pointed out. Um, is an opportunity here to do some leadership activities, which really, for me, fits in with a connection piece. Uh, I love the one that was suggested around some key stage two pupils, maybe engaging them as sports leaders um, and either live or doing it via a recording for the key stage one uh, pupils in the school uh, to do some uh, some PE activities and games uh, from a sports leader's perspective for them. So they're developing those communication skills, that confidence, um, in, in the role of as, as a coach rather than just as a pupil that's participating. Um, so, yeah, lots of really fantastic ideas coming out. Is there an opportunity for a bit more peer observation and feedback? Um, you could have some mirroring, mirroring games going on where they're working in pairs but still socially distant, um, where we've got a bit more uh, peer observations and, you know, peer, peer feedback, peer observations, a great assessment for learning tool, as we know, in physical education. So, there's perhaps an opportunity to do a little bit more of that. So there were, there were some of the things that stood out for me, and, and there were lots more than that. It's too many to mention, but as I said, we've, we've got a lot of the stuff on the handout at the end that you'll be able to download. Yeah, cheers for that, Chris. Um, so what we're going to do today is do something a little bit different in terms of we contacted the two gentlemen on your screen, and some of you may have read the articles they've been writing around um, PE in the future, what social distancing might look like in PE. They've put um, out a few articles through Medium. It's the one we sent out to you all prior to that. It's the one that you can download via the <coughs> handout. So me and Chris met with these two gentlemen on Tuesday morning. We recorded an interview with them. I'm just going to sh show you some clips of them that should address a lot of the things that you've already responded, really. And they've, they've got very similar thoughts and similar opinions, which should help you in terms of your confidence of where you're going with that. But it just gives an opportunity for, to get... A different viewpoint rather than just us two so um we're going to show you some videos i'll let them introduce themselves through the video so two seconds i'll play it and we can see what they've got to say hi there uh, my name is alan dunstan i'm currently the p health and well-being leader at the british school manila where i've been for the past eight years before that, I was teaching in Qatar for, for seven years. Before that, in Spain for a couple of years. And then my, my grounding up in South Yorkshire, in Rotherham, actually, for the, for the seven years before that. So I've been teaching since 1998, a hell of a long time. So lots of experience, both at home and internationally. Cheers, Al. Hi, everybody. My name's Lewis Keynes. Um, I'm the Director of Sport and Activities at the British School Manila in the Philippines. So we're at the same school 
Um, I, I went to Leeds Metropolitan University, did a, a PE with QTS degree in secondary education up there, and spent five years um, teaching in a, in a school in Weatherby, uh, and that's where I met Steve, who, who's one of the hosts on today's podcast, and, and, and from there, I moved to the Philippines, to Manila, um, seven years ago, um, and this is, this is my seventh year in Manila. Um, Manila's a, a, a multinationality school, uh, co-ed, about a thousand students strong from uh, EYFS all the way through to year 13. Uh, we deliver a, a structured PE curriculum uh, and a sports program. And in, in most, uh, in, in terms of most um, aspects of the school, we run very much like a British school does. Uh, we follow British curriculums, but rather than uh, A levels at post 16, we follow an IB diploma. So they're the, they're the two gents who are going to be um, sharing their thoughts with you throughout the rest of this webinar. We'll be in small clips where we pose them a question and they give their thoughts on it. After each question, we'll get some feedback from the chat box and just look at some of the things that you guys are saying, some of the opinions and thoughts around what they're, they're saying, and then we'll move on to the next one, essentially. It's really just to spark some debate, spark some thoughts in your mind as to what P might look like when you're back delivering. Um, just as a, um, a bit of a, not a disclaimer, but if you are uh, from the Sheffield region, and uh, like me, a Sheffield Wednesday fan, apologies for the little red badge that's next to Alan's head with the Sheffield United badge on, I apologise for that. If you're a Sheffield United fan, well done, good for you. But otherwise, yeah, that's a bit of a disclaimer on my part, I don't want to turn anyone off. So we're going to be um, putting on the next video, it's around five minutes long, anything that comes into your mind, Put it into the um put it into the chat box and tom and sharon will do their best to address as many points or themes as we can after the video is finished Um, so, so we've been asked to, to, to come here and just discuss a few different questions. And the, and the first one was, what do we think practical P will look like um, on the return to school, whether that be at the end of this school year or the beginning of next year? Alan, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, th thanks, Lewis. Um, I think it, first and foremost, we've got to learn from, from the guys in, in China, New Zealand, Vietnam, Taiwan, Taipei, Scandinavia, everywhere. It's really important we we look towards where they have been and what the journey they've been on. And probably it's, it's China that's that's had the longest back in schools that, that we need to look at first. Um, obviously, our parameters are, are going to be very different depending on the countries. So, some schools are allowing sharing of equipment. Some are, are demanding that you have your own P pencil case, as we're now sort of calling it. Uh, but. The, the common denominator here is that everybody's physical distancing or social distancing or whatever we want to call it. Um, so, so that's our starting point really of, of where we're looking to plan is what do we do in our curriculum then that's going to, in, that's going to make sure that everybody's physical distancing but we're keeping the E and PE and, and that's a big hashtag we've got going at the moment is E and PE. Um, and, and it comes from, the, from, comes from the old Joe Wixey uh, physical sessions where Yep, it's great that everybody's physically active on in the morning and he's getting nation moving, but really, is it PE? No, it's it's physical activity. And as much as that's part of PE, that's not PE. And, and moving forward to, to where we can be when, when we return to school, I envisage and I'm seeing in Asia lots of schools just choosing an activity that fits physical distancing. So they go in modified net games striking and fielding where they can place people at certain points um, they're doing dance yoga or fitness now lewis and i wrote an article recently about this and all they're doing is reframing their a physical activity or a, or a sport and they're not actually thinking about the empe what we need to be doing is looking at our why why are we teaching pe what do we want the kids to learn and how are we going to do it and I think Lewis has some really good points on how we can do that. Yeah, you know, the first thing to note is, 
and we've mentioned this a few times that we're not creating anything that, that's new that hasn't been done before. It's just trying to learn from a, a learning community that at the moment is being incredibly open and honest and really supportive of one another. And that's one of the, the key factors that we've found over the course of this last six weeks for us, seven weeks for us, 15 weeks for Hong Kong and China, that people are more than willing to reach out and help others and, and give suggestions and give ideas. And I think, like Alan said there, I think there is a temptation to think, right, we can't do invasion games, we can't do football, let's put net games in there instead. And, and all we're trying to do is question whether that's going deep enough in terms of the holistic development of the child. And, and does that put the child at the centre of the learning to say, well, actually from a, a physical, a, a sociological, a psychological and emotional point of view, that's the right thing for the child? Or are we just trying to find something that makes us feel a little bit more comfortable as professionals that are used to delivering sport? and teaching sport and, and a lot of sport in what is a, a PE curriculum and, and PE is, is so much more than sport um, and, and as Alan touched on there it's more than physical activity there, there has to be an educational element in there and, and there has to be an opportunity for children to develop and to learn more about themselves about one another and about the, the wider world and, and all we're framing this is an opportunity to really look at that and to really reflect and think whether as a school that's something that you do um, and, and we can all look at things to, to try and improve as, as individual um, institutions. And as I mentioned already, it's great to see that people are putting ideas out there. And not all those ideas are going to be relevant for every school. Um, there isn't a school that can pick up and play with another school's curriculum, not if they're doing it well. And, and I think that's the key thing here is to really look at what's doable in your locality, what's possible and, and why you want to deliver PE in the way that you do. Is your target to make fantastic under 11 sports teams? Is that really important to your school? If it is, your why is going to look very different to the holistic education of trying to develop adults that are physically active, that do understand that things don't come easy and that do understand that with hardship comes growth and comes success and, and they're deserving of that through doing things in the right way. I think, can I just come in there as well, just to finish off, Lewis? I mean, I envisage lots of cones and standing around if i'm going to be quite honest from a practical perspective and that's going back in time in it to how we've re-educated ourselves through games through understanding and through being through being clever in how we teach rather than setting up drills and i think what it lends itself really well to in, in this current time is, is going back to emphasizing the importance of fundamental movement skills physical literacy, which all can be done in a physical distancing situation. It just means more planning from a teacher. It's not an easy pickup. It's research and it's planning time that you have to spend on making sure what's right for the kids. Right, guys, so um, that's the first question that was addressed there. You can see on the screen what the question was. So I'm just wondering, Tom, Sharon, is there anything that particular that came out in the chat box that we can address or look at or have a think about? Yeah, there's lots in the chat box, Steve. Um, and thank you to everyone contributing. It's really good. It's it's a tough challenge to keep up with it, but I'll try my best. Um, the main theme coming out is, is around equipment uh, and how this is going to be uh, managed going forward so uh, Patricia mentioned right at the start around how how a school is going to share equipment out and that this is going to be a big issue um, it was referenced in the video around the PE pencil case maybe students have their own equipment that they use and look after um, Anna mentioned that we might have to start thinking about activities with less equipment it was a really nice idea from Wendy around uh, using chalk. So rather than having three million cones, uh, we can actually chalk up the playground and we know that's our area that we're playing in. Uh, so I really like that. Um, and then the last one, Julie mentioned around uh, schools needing to invest. So if they haven't already, they might need to look at what equipment they've got, take check of it and make sure that it's appropriate for, for the environment going forward. I suppose one of the things around the equipment is, in an ideal, we'd like to have the P pencil case one for every pupil. I can see that Chris has put on the chat box there in New Zealand, how they've got one bag of key equipment for each child. 
Um, probably the reality is, unless if you coordinate or if your IP coordinator has put in a big order recently, that's not going to be the case, even to the point that it might be an issue to do it for a bubble of 15. So it's just how we get around that and how we're going to allow then sets of equipment to then be used by year six after year two have used them. And if so, what's happening to that equipment in between? It's going to have to be cleaned, it's going to have to be wiped down. So it's really a tricky issue. Um, but the sports premium should support with that in the ideal world again where there should be money available to purchase equipment or more equipment if you haven't already got it but it is definitely a, a tricky issue and one of the biggest things we face so in terms of guidance we've seen already from AFP and YST it's saying to minimize the use of equipment where possible and it's just how what again goes back to context like Chris said earlier on what your school looks like what space you've got available what equipment you've got available and is it practical to purchase anymore at this current time yeah just <clears throat> quickly from me because i don't want to take up too much time make sure we get get all videos in but <clears throat> i love the fact and i saw on the chat box it flying up as well around the e and pe um and just making that transition from still doing physical activity but actually educating the children at the same time so we might be doing something physical but actually we might be educating in, in, in a socio-psychological domain or, or effective domain uh, yeah. from a learning perspective so so it's just getting that balance back in pe and, and making sure we don't forget the ebit which you know potentially and maybe quite rightly has has been um the case while we've been homeschooling but um but yeah that was a key one for me that e and p i like that little phrase Great, cheers, chris so the second clip is focused around this as you can see on the screen so how might you focus on the social emotional and psychological domains um, which is some a lot has already come out in the chat box in the previous question. So hopefully, just give you a bit more of an insight into what we could do. Chris, how might you focus on the social, emotional, and psychological domains in PE when we return to school? Um, I think the first thing to consider, as we've touched upon already, that PE isn't just sport and PE isn't just physical activity. There are many, many elements that make physical education so special and so important in our schools. And we'll all love sport. Sport's never going to go away. There's a place for that. But, but coming back into school after what we've been through as a, a shared human connection around the world, that probably isn't the right re-entry point. And, and the right re-entry point is probably more towards what we used to call and what maybe we still call a hidden curriculum of PE. And there's been a lot of talk recently about physical activity levels, about sport. We, we look at schools and, and many, many schools still structure their half terms and their terms around doing a unit of football or volleyball or tennis. And if that's right for that school and, and it's right for their vision and what they want from PE, there's nothing to say that that's wrong. There's nothing to say that that's incorrect. But what we're trying to explore a little bit further is, is that hidden curriculum of transferable skills, life skills, is that hidden curriculum of well-being and self-regulation and accepting where you're at as a person, learning about an active and balanced lifestyle, having a capacity for growth and resilience, developing a sense of belonging, are there things that should still be in a hidden curriculum for PE? Or should we maybe be a little bit bold and a little bit brave and say, well, actually, that is the point of PE and let's bring it out of the shadows and say, this is our whole point. And let's turn it on its head. This is our whole point of what we want. And to get to this ideal of children being resilient and being self-regulatory and appreciating other people, working collaboratively, communicating, cooperating, you know, recovering from failure, they're all things that PE as a vehicle has such a, a strong opportunity to grab hold of and say, we can do that through the medium of exercise, of physical activity, of sport, of physical literacy. And through that kind of, um, traction and through the interest of children through there you've got transferable skills that then in adulthood children can, can apply to a multitude of different things and and it isn't in adulthood whether they're good at playing football you know we, we all like football um, the guys that are on here but being an adult that's good at football doesn't make you any more uh, any more of a, a better fit for a job or a life situation but the skills that you learn along the way because you played in teams and because you develop skills and because you work with other people, they all do, you know, and there, there's no um, there's no surprise that generally the research suggests that people that are physically active and play sport are generally very successful people. People that can self-regulate are proven to have um, 
more likely to be successful in their adult life than uh, as with self-regulation as a measure than if we measured their IQ. So we've, we've got we've got the research out there and we understand the things that we deliver in PE. Uh, and what we're looking at is is do we actually deliver those things that we really want to develop? And do our SLT realize that? Do our school leaders know that what we're doing and the reasons that we're doing it? Or do they just see that we have year seven or year six doing a volleyball unit for six weeks? And, and that's the question to raise here. Can we learn, link and transfer those aspects of physical literacy to apply to physical activity, to apply to sport, to be given the chance for children to develop their well-being and, and their learning and life skills alongside it as well? Yeah, I can I can support what Lewis says there. Um, in, in our recent article, we, we've entitled it "Infinite Learning." It's you see so many approaches to learning out there: concept-based learning, values-based learning, student-centered learning. Lots and lots of jargon out there. Lots of research out there. And yeah, every model will proclaim to be the best way to teach, the best approach to learning. And what we try to get across is that there's no one way. That it's a real hybrid that is particular to your needs of your school and your students and, and trying to do the best. Yes, student-centered learning is the number one phrase out there, but what exactly is that in each context is the key here. And and in the article, we, we gave a little example from our, from our Key Stage 3 units, actually, where we have five strands of our health and well-being framework, one of them being self-acceptance, and that's the unit and, and we do use concept based learning then it's not a, it's not a volleyball unit or a football unit the unit is self acceptance and in self acceptance we are going to assess physical literacy skills we're going to look at where you're at in terms of your fitness and then we're going to plan appropriate action to make you improve in those aspects so it's totally changing the dynamics and getting away from from activity units that are sport driven we then got a unit called sense of belonging. That will bring into play things like invasion games, but it will be at their level. So they'd be, an, they'd be at a beginner's group. They might be a, a gender specific group. There'd be a, 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 a water polo one. So there's a swimming pool aspect of it. And then there'd be an inside option, maybe like a, a volleyball as a vehicle. But the object wasn't to improve them in those sports, although they will. The objective was to improve their sense of belonging and feel what it's like to be part of a team and then transfer those skills of collaboration, cooperation into being what's called real life useful skills. Um, great book by uh, Mac Chris McDougall, Bo Natural Born Heroes, it's called, about the Greek resistance in the Second World War and how British agents went in there and they found that the, the Cretans were unbelievable athletes up and down mountains. and they didn't do any training. They were they were natural born heroes because of their diet, the way they lived, the way they moved, and it was all about fundamental movement skills and getting those right. I think I think the key thing is that that schools appreciate that this is a period to have reflection, and, and it isn't necessarily a, a period where they pick something up and start from scratch all over again. But they pick the aspects that are. Are suitable and and that can be can be brought into their school to complement the work that they already do, and and it goes back to that question of 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 why are you doing what you're doing? Why is PE part of your school curriculum? And we all know as educators, there's a million and one reasons for that. But is that key reason to get better at volleyball, tennis, cricket, athletics? And and if it isn't, which it, it, it probably shouldn't be for most schools, or or it isn't for most schools, then do we need to look at that just from a different angle and start to prioritize the psychological and sociological stuff that has been brought so much to the forefront over the past six to 15 weeks, depending where you are on the world, and that we've all agreed has been a tough time for everyone? Does this represent a chance for us to, to just adjust and look at this from a different way and reflect and review and really take some time to see what suits our individual schools? Okay, so yeah, that's the second question and the thoughts of Lewis and Alan on that. Um, Tom, <laughs> Sharon, have we got any key themes that have emerged whilst that's been playing? Yeah. I'm just... Yeah, um, it's actually been quite encouraging to see um, 
how so many of the teachers recognize the creativity and inspiration the actual children can give them in trying to form those lessons. Um, the equipment may be limited, the space may be limited, but they, they really recognize that the creativity and the conversations and collaboration that can go on with social distancing can really unleash a lot of potential um, for giving the children um, the opportunity, I suppose, to be in touch with their feelings again, how they're feeling, because you know they all recognise here the the big role that P has in um, in helping to repair, I suppose, and recover these children through the physical, but actually not with that being the sole you know the sole focus with the fact that it's an opportunity for them to share how they're feeling with their with their peers and sort of explore that creativity through play. Um, and the other. Yeah, there was another one, um, a sense of belonging and resilience as an opportunity in social distancing. And um, I think it was James Lasso came up with the fact that, you know, this is a real opportunity of them of promoting self-acceptance and within the social distancing, sort of setting themselves personal challenges to, to improve that grit and, and so forth. Yeah, that was, that was something that came up. Uh, I think it was Emily Walker who referred to it, looking through around that. Um, grit that's in the article and um, I was thinking about that myself and my own daughter she's my daughter's seven years old we had been working on doing a maradona turn in the garden um, and would for the first time she really had to persist with trying to learn something which was deliberately quite difficult because I thought it'd take a period of time to learn but we, we she did it she mastered it and got probably took a week of going out just for 10 minutes at a time in the garden now we refer to that with everything. We refer to it with the literacy work. When she says she doesn't want to do a spellings, we refer to it. When she doesn't want to do timetables, rock stars, we refer to it. And just build it that little bit of grit, that bit of determination, resilience, something that we've really been building on throughout lockdown and my homeschool mm -hmm. anyway, but that will be the case everywhere. So I think this does provide that opportunity. And the one thing I just I just saw a few comments on um, was around the fear that PE could be put on the back burner. So there are a lot mm. of people on this call, there are a lot of people we've spoken to and addressed, we've had AFP, YST, all giving guidance. And these are PE experts, one of their word, struggling to see and come up with real ideas and have to be really creative and really persistent in trying to come up with ideas to deliver high quality PE in this environment. So will some schools, perhaps teachers who are less confident in delivering PE just think, I'll use this as an opportunity to catch up on literacy and numeracy. I think what he's massively accepted is that we really need to focus on the social and psychological stuff when we get back and improve and develop the mental well-being of our pupils and he's definitely a perfect vehicle for that to happen. Yeah, I've just got a couple of things, Steve, if I can jump in. Um, this, this is something that's really close to my heart. It's something that um, both when I was teaching in school, um, I championed and I'm, I'm championing sort of uh, since I've come out of school and I'm working in this role in sort of teacher training type type environments, it's around this hidden curriculum um, that Lewis referred to. And, and for me, it, it's never been a hidden curriculum. That's always been front and centre. It's always been about that holistic development. So how can I make a difference to the children I'm teaching in PE, socially, psychologically, physically and technically? Um, so for me, it, it's never been hidden, but for some people it might have been, and for a lot of schools it might have been, for, but for me now it's front and centre. And then just picking up on some of the chat box comments around things that would be, and I've been doing some of these in my home school and with my two, around Go Noodle, um, or thinking about the Daily Mile, or I've seen yoga come up, quite, quite a few uh, people mentioned that as an idea. Here's my question for you on those. How can you turn them from a physical activity into a pedagogical encounter because that's when you're going to put the e back into pe uh, and you can do it so great do some go noodle do some yoga but why are you doing it it's not just to keep them uh, busy happy and good uh, it's for a reason and, and i think what we're saying is here it's for socio-psychological reasons are really going to be what we need to focus on with the children so it's putting them on for that reason for me yeah Sharon. Um, the, third question, the third question that we posed to them was around seizing this uh, moment of opportunity and how we can shift the dial in schools in terms of how people perceive PE. Um, so the video is coming up now. 
No wish, anyway. Okay, Lewis, uh, seizing the moment and opportunity then, how might we shift the dial in, in the longer term to create a values-driven, pupil-centred curriculum that, that develops the child holistically, which switches them on to physical activity and sport and not off? The holy grail question. Every school wants to <laughs> answer it. I, I think it, it differs depending on the school and, and the context of the school. And I alluded to this earlier. I think the first step is to to find the reason why you want PE to be important in your school or why you believe PE is important. And there is nobody better placed to do that than PE teachers and, and educators within PE departments that are very passionate about the subject. And that's where we've got to start, to take that passion and say, well, what is it about PE that you're so passionate about? Get those ideas down and have that opportunity to have some disagreement, to have some debate and, you know, to have some discussion around those facts to be able to realize that actually let's pull these things together and then once we pull them together do we all agree on the same things and, and generally there'll be lots of aspects of that that people within a PE department and strong independent characters there'll be a lot of common ground there'll be a lot of strength within that collective um, brainstorm if you like or that collection of thoughts and I think that that's got to be a first step and um, once that's decided then it's going back and looking and sometimes you know swallowing your pride like we've done on many, many occasions and going back and say, well, hang on a minute, you're not doing this quite right and, and this bit's wrong and this could be better. And, and that's the tough bit because, you know, it's a, a sunk cost fallacy. You decide you're all in and, and you never really know when to break away and you think, well, I put too much energy in that. I'm not letting go of that when actually maybe sometimes it's the right thing to do. So, so to look critically and to take opinion from um, the staff that are in, in the department with you and your teammates and and the people that are involved in your PE program would probably be the first step. And then looking at what your values are as a department and, and considering what things drive you and, and the people around you. Is it that you want to be honest people? Is it that you want to be resilient and, and, and open to failure and willing to take risks and get it wrong and learn from them? Is it that you want to be competitive in the right way and be competitive and know how to compete with fair play? Is it that you want to be respectful to one another and you want to see the children do that? Is it that you want to show humility and put your hand up and say, you know what, I got that wrong and that's fine. That's just another bump in the road and we learn from that. And I think getting those ideas down, getting those values then gives you an opportunity to start to build on those and really critically analyse where you're at. And then the next step would, would probably be to, to make sure that the children have a say and that you have the opportunity to take on board children's perceptions, children's observations, children's feelings, because we all know that, that some children really enjoy PE. There are also a lot of children that really don't enjoy PE and they're just as important. So what do we do for those children to teach them these values and these life skills so that they can learn them, they can link them to different activities and different opportunities that they have within their school life and that they can transfer them to new things that maybe they haven't experienced yet. You know, we're educators that are very much preparing children for a world that we we don't know what that will look like you know in the last 15 20 years there's numerous jobs that didn't exist before then and, and that's the same moving forward so i think it all goes back to to the why and and really working out what that is first and looking at what you can change for the better in your context and then deciding on those values as a department to move forward and wherever you've got that kind of bedrock you know that moving forward, you're going to be on really strong ground because this is a collective decision you've made to focus on certain values, to focus on whatever it is that is your why, whether it be that you want the best sports kids at under 18 level or whether it be that you want adults that are a little bit more sociologically aware, a little bit more socio uh, psychologically aware and a little bit more physiologically aware. What is it? And once you've got that, it's a great bedrock to move on, to push on and to support one another on what has the potential to be a really fun journey um, that, that will last years. You know, Alan and I have, have been at this for 30 odd years between us. We've worked together for seven years and it, it's not perfect. It's far from it. There are lots of things we want to change. We want to adjust, but it goes back to the whole All Blacks kind of legacy of, you know, you leave the shirt in a better place. What you're doing here is to, to get the best deal for kids and to get the best opportunity for children moving forward. And it's not about you as the teacher. It's about them and what you and the people around you can do to support them moving forward. And 
and, and nothing will, will leave a legacy that, that's more attractive and, and more beneficial to a child than a team of people that are really passionate, that work together on a, on a shared goal. Um, and, and I think that that's easy to forget and that, that would probably be the starting point out. How, yeah. how, do you see, how do you see this going with your, your, your move to the new school in Riyadh? Yeah, I, I like your point about really learning from failures there. And when I think back to being a new teacher when I was up in Scunthorpe in a, in a real rough comprehensive school in Scunthorpe and how we dealt with low ability kids and low socioeconomic backgrounds and it, transferring that and then cross to Rotherham with, with a similar cohort of, of students and dealing with a merger. And we just got it so wrong. Just got it so wrong. We, we didn't pitch it at the kids. It was all about, we're going to do it this way and you're going to follow. And, and sometimes you've got to be brave. And, and, and what we've done in the last few years is just being brave and say to the kids, what do you want to learn? What, what, what is it from PE that you will find valuable in the long term? What groups do you like to work in? And, and believe you me, the, the results you'll get from doing that kind of analysis will take your breath away. You, all the things that you think about as a PE teacher, you won't think about a response from the little shy, shy little girl who's not, who's not really into a PE, but she's a brilliant mathematician. What that girl might come back with is something that, you know what, I, I really like working with my friends in a non-competitive situation. And we're then forcing them to go and play basketball with the top basketball girls in the school. That's it, switched off, gone, done. And once you go back to that and get the student's opinion, you can really start to develop a program that is properly student-centered. Because if you don't ask their opinion, how is it going to be student-centered? And, and, and moving, sorry, go on, go on, Lewis. I was just going to add to that. I think anecdotally, what, what I've certainly seen over the past two or three years is, is less of that divide between the, the stronger children that really like PE and the weaker children that have that perception that it's not really for me. And, and along with that, it's made me question that in the past, have I had that old school PE teacher view of, well, some people just aren't very good at PE. And, and that, that, that isn't good enough really, is it? And, it? and it's trying to provide for those children that are weaker in terms of what they can do physically and, and from a skill and technique point of view, but actually allow them to access something that will teach them and will give them values, life skills that transfer. And, and you know, the, some of the children we've taught over the past three or four years, Alan, you would describe generally as quite low ability children that really, really enjoy P and physical activity and, and everything that comes around that. And we've seen huge um, improvements in terms of the participation rate in our sports programs as a result of them being inclusive. And as a result of our PE curriculum, trying to create the values and, and push the skills that will allow children to access more success within the sports program without replicating the sports program in the curriculum. Yeah, it, it, it's a good point though. We, I, obviously, I'm, I'm the curriculum leader and Lewis is director of sport. I mean, they are separate, but they're also very intrinsically linked. But our curriculum is not driven by sport or by getting teams out of the weekend. And fundamentally, that's a, a massive, massive point because that's not the case in, in, a, in a vast majority of schools. Uh, and, and moving forward to, to my new job, I, I'm going to be going into a, a school in, in Saudi Arabia where it's just primary at the moment and building forward. The, the, the methodology in this is going to be student-centred, values-driven, uh, a real PE curriculum, which is a fantastic curriculum by Create Development Group in the UK. But as Lewis alluded to earlier, it, it's not about the curriculum, it's also about the people that drive it and they have to be invested in that. So, so one of my first goals is going to be really getting buy-in from my staff to deliver a really good set of values to the children where physical literacy is at the heart, not worrying about the sport program, that will come with time and with expertise, but fundamentally physical literacy at the heart and values being the key to the, to the success. Right, guys, so um, fairly lengthy response in terms of that, that third question on the screen and lots to cover. Hopefully some of it you will have come across as well in previous webinars. If I've attended, Sharon and Tom delivered a fantastic webinar around holistic development. So this 
the thoughts of the two guys, Alan and Lewis, really just reaffirmed a lot of the things we were thinking and talked about, which was really good to hear. Um, anything from the chat box again, guys? I've responded to a few things directly, but there's there were lots of things being fired through, so I can see them all. Yeah, there's lots in there, which is brilliant. Uh, I'm just going to pick out some and just try and link them together if possible. Um, so right at the start, Matthew and Dion were talking about obviously the children having a voice and helping to design that curriculum. So they get a say in the lessons that they're going to be experiencing. Um, and then Steve and Susan later mentioned that probably a key part of this when we get back to our new normal uh, will be building confidence because it might be that they're stuck inside for so long that they've lost confidence, they've lost the connection with their friends. Uh, and that's going to be a real key part when we go back to our new normal. Uh, and at the same time, Susan mentioned just around when we're trying to build their confidence that we're not just focusing on the sporty ones. And it may be the, the less sporty children too. Um, Ian mentioned that it can be difficult uh, working in a school, so winning over SLT. Um, and later on, Sean, Sean made a really good point, which I see quite a few people have responded to around. PE provides us the chance to really bring alive your school values. So whichever school values you have, it's a real good opportunity to bring those alive within each lesson. Uh, and I think Steve alluded to it in the chat box. We've had... Um, webinars that are coming up actually but also that we've delivered where we've talked about this and how we can do this yeah it's something that has been covered like in the previous <clears throat> moving forward and just we're just in the planning stage for the next block and next, next series of webinars it's something we're looking at it has come out consistently in all the um, webinars we've delivered so something we are looking to go into more detail in moving forward because it's something we definitely believe in and we push with the people we work with currently on a more face-to-face -face basis, really focusing on how them school values can be married into the PE curriculum and really brought out, explicitly brought out through the PE. So that was, it was good to see that um, Sean made that point and he was really well appreciated by so many people on the chat box by the looks of it. Yeah, I noticed yeah. that one as well. I've made a note, note, note of Sean's comment. Also, Julie Pearson, I loved your comment, Julie, around, I'm going to quote you here, I truly think this is a, a time to rethink what PE actually is. Um, and I, I really think this is an opportunity to do that. And I know there's going to be challenges and barriers and some SLT might not be on board or PE might, might not be high upon the agenda in some schools where in other schools it's really embedded into the school life and school culture. Um, but I guess... The reason we're all on this webinar is because we believe in the power of PE. Uh, we, we believe in the power of the E in PE. Um, and, and it's our job to try and convince them and keep chipping away, I, I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I've also noticed there's some of you have been asking for a little bit more direction around what exact activities can they do, what will it look like. But I think it's really important to remember this is, even though it's happening globally, it's a very local way in how we can respond to it because it will depend on your facilities, your employers' um, recommendations, um, the facilities you have, the type of children you're working with. Because, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of children who are actually quite struggling in this environment. But there has been some research that also some children are thriving in the homeschooling environment, those who sometimes struggle with the social with the busyness of the chaoticness of invasion games and so forth, and those on the autistic spectrum. So we've got to take this as an opportunity to see how we can shape that and make PE suitable and accessible for everyone to get the benefits out of it going forward as well. But it is a learning curve and there is no one size fits all. Yeah, definitely. I suppose it's about experimenting Due, due to all the characteristics you've just mentioned there, Sharon, and also I suppose the only guidance we've really received has been from the Youth Sport Trust released some yesterday, which was and the AFPI mm -hmm. released some guidance today, which will be released in the handouts in a second. Actually, the, if you want to see that guidance, there was there were some suggestions in there um, around activities and what they could look like. So one example was without going through it all, you can read it for yourself orienteering and utilizing outdoor space how that can be very individual in task and socially distanced well 
however also contributing to a team so they could be in teams that relate to the groups they're in, in the classroom for example and they create collecting points um, they'll talk around individual games like target games and even like I said, like I did with my daughter earlier on, them sort of skills, activities that are going to take some real persistence and resilience to get to. And they may have like a computer game card like relates to the next level. Once you've achieved this, move to the next level, move to the next level. And there's been a lot of reference I've seen in the chat box regarding to personal best in line with the curriculum. And that's something we can definitely really focus on, um, specifically focus on because of the impact that we're going to be forced to work with it. And it's almost like looking at the two meter distancing as a, as a condition or a strain that you might put on a game to try and get the best out of some individuals. So trying to put a bit of a positive spin it rather than a negative. But the guidance that has come out from YST and AFPI will is in the handouts. When I email out everyone after this, I will also include that just so you've got that information if you haven't seen it already. And also you can just obviously just Google it and see it reasonably quickly. But there are some recommendations in there and there will be a lot of stuff in there that your school will have had to consider already in terms of risk assessments that they will have been doing endlessly. And no doubt many of you, are like my, if anything like my wife, have been doing nothing but risk assessments for the last week. So all them sort of things will be in place. Be creative. The ideas, the conversations, the input on the chat box has been absolutely remarkable. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to be really collaborative, learning from everyone and the expertise that's on this call. So it's been absolutely brilliant to see. Thanks, Steve. I'm uh, just going to wrap things up, folks. Appreciate it. we've got a couple of minutes left and we're going to try and stick to times. Um, there's a couple of quotes there from, um, I think someone mentioned it on the chat box, actually, that might have read the same article I've read, a recovery curriculum. It's worth a look if you haven't seen that before. The reference is down the bottom there. Uh, but just a parting thought, really, and just to try and, I'm not sure I can sum up everything we've done, because I think if we could bottle, bottle all the comments that are in the chat box and, and what have been discussed by the videos, I think it'd be... Um, it'd be worth some value that i think but um but yeah just to sum it up when i was planning this um with steve this week i, I spoke to my son ethan he's in year four i said what what are you missing most about school ethan and he said um my friend's dad and that sort of sums it up really i guess it's that social interaction piece uh, and, and that loss of that um so it's about how we support them back into that process isn't it um, and i guess the reason we all sign up to become teachers um it is for that to help children along along the journey of whatever age and stage we might be teaching. Um, so, just to signpost to what's coming next, um, uh, we're having a half term break next week. Um, uh, as um, uh, is it half term? I, I think we've lost where we are. It's, it is May half term, isn't it? I think. Um, yeah. So, um, so we're not delivering any webinars next week, um, but we are planning uh, another mini series for June. Um, so the next one for your diary is the fourth of June. And that's planned to be a live Q&A session, uh, almost a bit of rev a review of what we've done previously. Um, and also we're planning some things that might 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 lie ahead as well, because it's an ever-changing environment, isn't it? Um, so keep an eye out via Twitter, uh, as per usual, um, uh, for the links to those. Um, and now available to download on the handouts uh, will be the certificate of attendance, the slide decks, and all the handouts that have been mentioned. So, uh, so please help yourself to those before you before you sign off um, and then I guess all that says from um, remains for us to say is thank you very much for engaging both today and in previous weeks if you've done that um, we look forward to welcoming you back in June to some more to some more of this that we're going to do and we're going to try some different ideas and formats of delivery as well but thank you very much to all those that engage engage in the pre-webinar questions that really helped us put this together today um, and I hope the sort of less content from us and more involvement from yourselves has, has really helped. Um, anything else from you, Steve, before we finish? No, just a massive thank you for the input. It's been absolutely fantastic to hear. It wouldn't have been anywhere near as productive without such input and responsive guys. So big thank you. And we'll see you in a few weeks, hopefully. And thanks, Tom and Sharon, for manning the chat box for us. Yeah, cheers, thank guys. you. No problem. Stay safe. Thanks all. Thanks for your time. Guys.